You're listening to the Autism Weekly Podcast. Each week, we share community voices and bring light to stories that increase awareness, acceptance, equity, access, and inclusion. If you haven't already, subscribe to join the Autism Weekly family. I'm your host, Jeff Skibitsky. This week, we welcome autism advocate Marcus Boyd to the podcast to talk about the importance of finding your voice. Marcus was non-speaking as a child and diagnosed with autism as a teen. He now regularly advocates on behalf of the autism community. He's also the CEO of Marcus Boyd Beats, where he produces and composes music and has won numerous awards. One of his goals right now is to spread autism awareness through his voice and his platform with videos, fashion, and music. Marcus hopes his autism community can feel that they are not alone and that they have the same voice that he has. Marcus, welcome to the podcast. Wow, welcome. Thank you. It's amazing, and I'm honored to be a part of this amazing family the po- and podcast. Well, I'm excited to have you on because as I was looking at your history is that not only have you been working on some pretty amazing beats over the last 20 years, but uh, if I'm correct, you've done some modeling, you've won awards, you're now speaking, is that you have quite a big audience to be able to talk with. But I'd love to hear from you just, you know, what it is that now has given you your voice. What about your journey has said, you know, I want to speak out and empower others? Um, Five years ago, when I became an autism activist, um, it was, first of all, it was unheard of because you had parents and guardians and caregivers and volunteers advocating for their children or advocating for a nephew, niece, or a friend or something of that nature. It was not like an activist that's just going to the school boards, uh, state capitals, like NAACP meetings, like having having meetings with the National Autism Society in London. That stuff was not happening five years ago. So I decided to do it because my friend who grew up with me in the tub, her son is nonverbal and he's severely nonverbal and he has autism and he cannot speak. So I had, I was set on going to Walmart and I live in, at that time I was living in Georgia. So anybody know about Georgia? I-285 is a big old circle. It was super raining. And she said that if I didn't go to her church and spread my testimony, she was going to drop me off in the rain on I-285. <laughs> So I kind of agreed to go to her church because she felt like, you know, she was with me when I was nonverbal. So this way before she had her son. So Mm -hmm. she felt like God gave me a chance to speak and I don't want to tell my testimony. Maybe my testimony can help somebody else. And I think that that I think that the courage to be able to do that and to put yourself out there, I think is something that. I'm seeing more advocates, self-advocates do, because there's so many people that have contributed in so many ways in this society that advocate or that identify autistic, but have a voice to be able to advocate for their role, their abilities, and the chance for them to continue to help everybody in the community continue to develop. Um, But let's talk about your music a little bit, Marcus, only because oftentimes is some of the strengths of the autistic community lead to specific skill sets, lead to the ability to produce such wonderful things, whether it's within their jobs, within their relationships. One of the components that obviously you have an an, an innate ability to be able to do is produce music. Is there anything that is specific to the way that you think or approach life that helps you to create your music right now? Um, you know, I started making music when I was almost 15 and I'm 39. So, um, I was in band camp, concert, concert band, you know, marching band concert. Um, you know, my grandma, she had 24 kids and my mom had 22 of us. So my grandma was a switch in church. That was her only language was a switch in church. So, (laughs) so, you know, growing up in Brooklyn, New York, that, it, that was it. It was it was either the streets or music. That that it was nothing else. <laughs> like you only had two doors. You're gonna walk in one of them. So um music became a friend to me. 
as being nonverbal and having autism, I didn't have friends. I didn't have people to understand the autism back when I was coming up. So music understood. It didn't judge me. It didn't say I couldn't sit next to him at lunch. It didn't say I couldn't sit next to him on the bus. It didn't care that I had differences. So music was my friend. And I think that those are the things that hopefully your voice is starting to empower is the fact that maybe as much as music has become such a big identifying factor to your life, it's it's understanding those other components is bringing other people in is helping them to understand so that at the age of 13 or 15 is that they can enjoy your music with you is that they understand how talented you probably were even at that age and we're able to experience that with you on that journey though is that can you give us just a little bit of background because you went from it sounds like somebody who was hesitant to use their voice or maybe even didn't didn't have that uh the vocal component and that music was your expressive but how did it how was it going growing up as a teen or even earlier than a teen not feeling like you were able to find your spot in your community? Well, Mr. Jeff, you have to understand, I come from the projects. You understand what I'm saying? I come from low-income poverty. So I, where I come from, nobody had a voice. No, Nobody, you know, everybody didn't get to use their gifts or talents properly. Everybody was trying to come out of one place, which was poverty. You, you understand what I'm saying? So for me, being having autism, being nonverbal, being in foster care, being in different homes, being in group homes, being in hospitals, being in inpatient centers, you, you, you understand what I'm saying? So it was like, how do you deal with a nonverbal child? How do you make them listen? How do you give them direction? How do you, they're they nonverbal, they, plus they, they have emotional episodes, plus they're acting out. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? So how do you deal with this plus you got 40 something other kids in a one bedroom one bathroom and they got maybe got issues of their own too yeah no for sure and i think that that's part of what is still going on in our community is trying to figure out even within the autism community how to be able to allocate resources so that underserved populations of people still have the chance to be able to benefit from every resource that's out there to be able to help pull out the gifts, to pull out their abilities at all times so that there isn't this inherent gap. But I mean, one of the things that that allowed you to succeed was your music, obviously. But what what led you from being that 15 year old and, and doing some self exploration and starting to play with music to actually developing a career and is is there any influence from autism still within your music? Do you pull off of any of that? Do you have any component where you're trying to speak to the autism community through your music? I'm always going to speak to my community. I'm always going to speak to my family. You know what I mean? I, I you know, autism. My, that's my autism family. You know what I mean? Those, those are my cousins, my my sisters, my brothers, my my mom, my dad. You know, regardless of what religion or race. We all, that's my family. So I'm always speak to them. And, and, you know, for me, I hear melodies and beats like people hear conversations. I always been like that. So musically, I just format it in a musical term with the BPMs, with the kicks, with the melodies, with the, with the samples, with the drums, with the pianos, guitars, whatever, whatever. So, you know, I'm always trying to express musically how I feel because I was nonverbal and music was my voice, literally. So people didn't care that I was using a bathroom on myself at a certain age. They wanted to hear the music. So music was was somebody that I could not be physically. Music was a popular individual. So music was like, okay, well, I'm going to be Marcus until Marcus becomes Marcus. Yeah, and that must be super empowering. I mean, what what you're talking about there is that I can see the gift. I can hear it when I'm hearing the music. And when you look at even the diagnostic traits of, of autism, a lot of it has to do with patterning. A lot of it has to do with the kind of the repetition or being able to take different patterns and formulate them differently. And I think I hear that in your beats is that you do such a good job of putting things together. I mean, to the point that you're winning awards and maybe you can share with us some of the awards that you've already won, but 
I'm hearing it in your music, and I can tell that you have that gift. Um, and what what have you won over the years? I mean, it, it would be nice for our audience to hear that. Well, you know, I'm very uh, I'm a very humble person, but I have 13 music awards. I've been nominated for a Grammy seven times, and I'm the first African American to have four awards as an autism activist. And I just got mentioned in Forbes magazine. So, as I'm the first uh, autism person to be mentioned in Forbes. So. I, and and already just being able to be on a list like that has got to be something that other people, well, and, and I think that you hit on it, is that your culture is your culture, is that you're going to identify in a variety of different ways. Culture isn't always associated with where you're from or what color you are or your religious background. Culture could also be an autistic identity. It could be a variety of things. And the way that your culture sees you and in Forbes, now they're seeing themselves in some small way. Do you have people reaching out to you and saying, you know what, that that's influential to me. That made me feel like I can achieve. Do you do you get to hear that feedback? I mean, I, 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 I do. You know, Zimbabwe, London, Scotland, Pakistan, Philippines, uh, Asia. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, we just, I'm just, you know, Taiwan, I mean, you know, people constantly, I mean, they, they blowing up my phone. I'm on an interview with you right now. My phone's still buzzing. Um, <laughs> um this is an everyday thing that's been going on for five years. And it, for me, it, it's like, I get joy to actually, cause I call these people back or I email them back or I text them back. And I really have real conversations with these, with the individuals because I don't want them to feel like I'm too whatever, whatever. Cause I'm nothing. My trials and tribulations are just like yours. I'm the same, just as you, I'm nobody special. I'm no nothing, but you know, I'm here for you. I may not be able to medically say your son or daughter going to be talking tomorrow, or I may not be, you know, in a position to, you know, give you medicine or something that you should try or take. I'm not that person. The only thing I can do is give you love, encouragement, and advice, and to let you know that you're not alone, and I stand with you. Yeah, but I mean, at the same time, I would say is that just even hearing you talk and knowing what I've been able to read, and even just taking a second to listen to some of the, the music that you put together, it's inspiring. And I think we all seek inspiration and it gives us the hope that, you know, I'm going to take that extra step. I'm going to do something more because I don't need to feel fear of failure because I'm seeing people achieve. Um, when you think back to your childhood, though, is that, I mean, you, you very well could have not found music. You very well could have kind of reverted back to a, a position where, you know, people you had friend or lack of friends, you had said. So you had people that made you withdraw from a lot of the community. What are you what are you now as an advocate talking to these young children that may be in elementary school, maybe in their middle school programs? What are you telling them about utilizing their gifts to be able to to build community? Do you speak to them or are you speaking through your music? I do speaking engagements, a lot of them. I do virtual, in-person, traveling. <laughs> I mean, I do a lot of speaking engagements, and I talk to a lot of colleges, kids, um, prisoners, juveniles, senior citizens, adults, teenagers. And, you know, my, my whole big mantra or big thing is tap into the gift that's inside of you. And regardless if you're nonverbal or not, because you're still verbal. It's just that your caregiver and your parents have to find your way of communicating. It's not you finding a new way of communicating. They need to find your way. So it may not always be vocally. And you have to tap into that gift because everybody has a gift and everybody has a talent. Some people have multiple gifts and talents. So you have to tap into all of them. Don't just focus on one. Be a master at all of them because all of them are going to help change your life. No, and and I think I I mean I think it does. I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Is that first you have to find what your gift is. Then you have to feel confident to start start exploring it and being out there and putting yourself in a position where you might feel vulnerable. Um, which when I'm looking at your music and and you had said that you know you've been doing beats for a long time, but you are also a gospel rapper. 
for somebody who grew up nonverbal to now feel confident in large venues using their voice and not just the music that they're putting together with the melodies, but actually utilizing the voice in those venues, that to me is powerful to go from not speaking to being able to feel confident to get up there in front of people. How was that journey? I mean, that couldn't have been overnight. You must have had supports with you. <laughs> it wasn't, and it still is a journey. It still, today, it still is a journey because there's a lot of times I'd be like, nope, I'm not coming out of my room. Nope. I mean, I mean, you understand, I still have emotional behaviors. There's a lot of times where I, I break flat screen TVs, remotes, headphones, and stuff like that over the simplest things. I can't tell you how many times I done broke a flat screen, 55, 65, inch, 70 inch. I'm, I'm telling you, I done broke them. <laughs> so um, I still deal with my own inner situations. I, I, I still have autism. Autism is not going nowhere. It's not a cure for it. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not a, it's not a disease. It's, it's, not a, it's not a disability. It's a superpower. So I, I praise God that he gave me my own superpowers. He let me become a superhero. So mm -hmm. it's not an easy thing. It, I still feel like sometimes like, nope, I'm not, I don't care if they want me in California. I'm not going. I done caught red eye planes because I was late. I got on the last plane because it took my PR, my family, my, my manager, my, my booking agent. They had to fly out here to come literally get me. So, so, I mean, I still deal with those things. And, and that makes, a, I mean, we all have those things within us that we're always trying to get better and get stronger with. And I think what you're explaining very articulately is that journey, that journey doesn't go away. And even if you have some of the more intense behaviors that you're describing, is that you're still figuring out how to continue to navigate because you have passions that are out there. But you did mention that you had a community around you. You have those other people that are trying to be able to help you through that process. How important is it to have those supports around you so that you're not navigating that frustration on your own or not navigating those emotional components, which are very hard to work through on your own and withdrawing, yet you have these friends, this community who's pushing you forward to saying, you know, Marcus, I'm gonna do this with you. On your timeline, we're gonna get there. We're gonna get to the next place. So tell me about that community you've built up and how important they are. Well, you know, Mr. Jeff, coming from the projects, I didn't have a father. My father was not there in my life and that's a whole nother story. But um, what I did have was a six foot six or six foot seven, guy from Canada, from Canada. He was Caucasian. His name was Bob Ortner. You know, that was my first behavior aid. Again, I don't even know if they call him behavior aids no more, but that was my first mentor slash behavior aid. He came in the projects. I mean, in the projects, he was passing out like starter jackets, like, like he was giving away Braves tickets and the Hawks tickets. And some of the big drug dealers was going in his van. We was all going, we I mean, he hugged me when I was crying at night. He became a father that I never had. I mean, I ain't care what his skin color was because he was in the project. He was eating turnip greens just like at my grandma's table. Just like, I mean, <laughs> like we went to Canada because he invited us to his house too many times. So what I understood was his family and the community that was in Canada. He brought that to the projects. He brought his wife. He brought his two, three daughters. They was it, it was it was not just like they was working with me. They was working with known drug dealers in my in my projects. Like they hit the drug dealers' kids was going with Bob Orton's kids. It became it became more than just a, a project building. It became Bob and the family. And and that's amazing. I mean, it, it, and that's where it comes from. It comes from the level of trust is that if somebody's able to come in into whatever community, it's it's always hard to enter into a new community. But if you come in and establish the trust is that then you have everybody working around the common goal. And I mean, that might be 
I mean, in this situation, it might have been how can we help Marcus with some of the behaviors or how can we give him a voice or support him? Or it could be how do we as a community establish some of these things that will create a safe environment for all kids to be able to work and prosper? Um, but those are, I mean, that's the key to any sort of support system. And it sounded like having a behavioral support was was beneficial, but it, it also sounds like this is ongoing. This is something that will always be a part and the knowledge being shared becomes Im important. Do you speak also on behalf of just having the community understand that my outbursts are a part of me at times and it's something that I'm working on, but it's also something I want everybody around me to understand that this is who I am and, and we all need to work through this together and not to withdraw from me if I get emotionally frustrated in situations or if I, like you said, broke the TV. It's just, this is something I'm working on. Stay with me and work with me through this. Do you feel like you have to do a lot of that coaching? Yes. Yes. Even at almost 40. Yes, because people are not going to understand your moves or your actions. And, you know, I think it really got worse for me when I lost Bob Ortner. Again, he was the only father that I ever known. So, you know, I made him at three. I lost him at almost 15 because he was trying to come. Some guys were beating me up in my projects and he was trying to race across the street to, you know, drive across the street to come save me. And he got hit by a truck. You understand what I'm saying? So um, it really, <laughs> that really sparked my emotional behaviors to a whole nother situation because I blame myself for his passing. And, you know, now it's like I have to be on interviews and, and tell people it's okay. It's okay to have emotional behaviors. It's okay. It's nothing wrong with it. If the thing is, is that you just have to surround yourself with a care group. I like to call them a care group. You just have to surround yourself with a care group that will be able to understand, uplift, and support you in your emotional behavior. Well, I mean, where where are these care groups? I mean, for you, it sounds like a big part of who you are is is embedded in your religion and in your community. I mean, is that the first place that you'd be recommending for resources for people to say, you know, we need a safe place for you. These are some places to look. This worked for me, but maybe these are some other resources in your community. Do you have ideas? Um, no, because I don't what I, I, I tell people all the time that you have to do and you have to go what's best for you, what's feel comfortable for you. I can't say go to Jesus because you, you may not call him Jesus or God. You may call him a different name, or I can't say go to mom and dad or go to sister and brother, because you may not want to go to mom and dad or sister and brother. So you have to go to the place and you have to go to people that you know that's going to love you and it's going to accept you. Don't not be afraid to speak up. Speak up. Use your voice. Use your communication. Let somebody know that something is bothering you, that it's too much, that you can't take it. It's, you're not weak. You're not a punk. You, you're, 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 you're just amazing as you are. So let somebody know if it's too much. So your care group can come and help you. And, and I think that that's wonderful uh, advice. And I think that, that goes beyond the autism community. That goes to everyone is that you have to build that support. You have to build trust and know who it is that you can turn to but continue to build on it. Don't let it be two people. Continue to grow that network of close people within your lives as time goes on because you're going to need it at some point. Um, I, I do want to hear a little bit more about your music only because it's it's the emotion that 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 you probably have in certain parts of your life must drive some of the music as well is that you're feeling that and maybe it's like a tableau or like an artist canvas is that you're putting it out there do you blend emotion with some of the pattern beats to really kind of express your feelings and can you can you identify that in the songs pretty well yes i do that in the beats and the title if anybody knows me if it, it, it goes by my title if it if the title says um she won't love me because I have autism. That means 
that I really went through a woman saying, no, she don't want to be with me because I have autism. So I put my emotions not only in the beat, but in the title. So, I mean, there's a reason why it's titled the way it's titled. With every, all my 83,442 beats I have. And you obviously have have the confidence over time to be able to share all that, to put that out there. What what would you be telling to to other people? And as far as sharing their story, and and not everybody's going to feel as comfortable as as what you're doing is going out there and letting people learn from all your experiences. But what has that what has that done for you? I mean, has it been cathartic? Has it felt good emotionally just to be able to say, you know, I'm going to put it out there? And just even expressing it has given me some relaxation. Or is it always nerve wracking to to put yourself out there? I think in the beginning, when I started this five years ago, it was super nerve wracking. Every day it was nerve wracking. I wanted to quit, didn't want to do it, didn't want people to know my story. Who? Why would they care about me? Everybody got trials and tribulations. Yeah, in the beginning it was like that. But now I suggest everybody, please, you need to write your own self biography. You need to you need to do your own documentaries. You need to let the world know about your story because yes, everybody may got a whooping, or yes, people may got picked on in school, or yes, everybody may dealt dealt with something similar. But it's always going to be different because your story is different from the next individuals. I don't care. I mean, you know how many documentaries there is on police. You know what I mean? It's a bunch of them. But if somebody put out a new documentary on police right now, many people going to watch it because it's new to them. It may be not new to the person, but it, it's new to them. So I suggest everybody put out their story because you don't know who can be enlightened and affected by your story. Uh, and I appreciate that you do that, Marcus, because that transparency is what allows us all to grow and learn is that you only know your own experience but if you're not talking about it with others and you're not sharing openly is that 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 creates this gap in our communities but with what you're doing right now is that you you said that you know put out your autobiography i mean I, I know that you shared with me that you're in the process of doing that yourself. I mean, can you tell us a little bit about not just what you're doing with that, but then also how others can get to hear your music? Because I found that so enlightening to be able to sit down and listen to what you've put together and put a voice to the music that you've created. Um, so where can people find the upcoming book that you're writing? <laughs> and then also everything about your business, your speaking engagements. Um, they can find the book is called a boy with no voice. There's a, there's a minute, there's a mini movie on YouTube right now. It's called the boy with no voice. Um, so it gives you little 19, 20, 20 minutes of my life with autism. And it, it, it won two major international film awards in India. We put this out about seven, eight months ago. So, um, the boy with no voice it's going to be an autobiography book about my life. And next year, you will be able to see the TV series. So we're doing a whole TV series about the boy with no voice so people can really understand me from zero to 30 or zero to 35. I'm 39. You, you understand what I'm saying? So we're going to open up the floodgates. We're going to open up the whole book. <laughs> and they'll be able to find it on my website, on Amazon, on many different book websites. And my website is autismactivistmarcusb.com. They can go there. You'll be able to find it on Facebook. Any, in, anywhere, because I want people to really understand the story. And, you know, with everything else, with the speaking engagements, they can go on my website, autismactivistmarcusb.com. If people want to, you know, book me or stuff of that nature. And, you know, with the shoes and the coloring books and the headphones and it's just a lot, my clothing line, it's just a lot of stuff. Because at the end of the day, I want to change the way people see and feel about autism. I want them to feel cool and feel like it's dope and fresh or whatever the word is, that they can be represented with still having autism. That's why autism have its very first designer clothing line. It's called the A Collection. And they have the, the very first spiritual tennis shoe. It's called G-Souls. So where we put in um, 
Bible verses in the insole of the shoe. So we changing the way that people really believe and, you know, deal with, with God. I appreciate all that you're doing out there. And, and I do recommend that people go to your website to be able to do that, whether it's to be able to check out, because I, I saw the clothing and I saw the modeling as well as that. I mean, it, it takes a lot of confidence to go out there and express, but I have a feeling that those things are going to kick off very well and that you're, it's going to get people to, to be excited about just the, the community that you're developing, but also the music. So, but thanks so much, Marcus. I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your experience with us. And uh, you already have a fan and I'm going to be checking out the, the series as well and getting that book because I can't wait to learn more about your story. And, and the best way to do this is hear from the voice itself. So an autobiography, I'm there for. <laughs> well, I'm honored and I thank you and your team for letting me be on this major, amazing major platform and continue to touch these lives, not only in the autism community, but worldwide. And, and I, I'm honored that you and your team give autism people and advocates and educators and, and, and researchers and things of that nature a voice so they can continue to teach and enlighten this community. Our pleasure. We're, we're glad that you were able to be a part of that. Thank you for listening to Autism Weekly. We hope you tune back in next week to learn more about autism in the real world. Autism Weekly is now found on all the major listening apps, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and more. Subscribe to be notified when we post a new podcast. Autism Weekly is produced by ABS Kids. ABS Kids is proud to provide diagnostic assessments and ABA therapy to children with developmental delays like autism spectrum disorder. You can learn more about ABS Kids and the Autism Weekly podcast by visiting abskids.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you again next week.